just two simple words, my sister. Show up. Yes. Show up for Black people. Show up for Latinx people. Show up for Asian people. Show up for gay people. Show up for disabled people. Disabled things that you can see and disabled things that are inside. Neurodiverse people. Just show up for all those people and talent from those various diverse backgrounds. Show up. I'm sick and tired of the article after article after article on, oh, we should do this and we should do that and we should do this and we should do that. Show up and show out. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Justice and Power. I have an amazing guest here with me today, Kenny Thatcher, who's coming all the way from Manhattan, New York, to talk to us about his work with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's get into something. <laughs> so I'm going to give a brief intro about Kenny. Kenny Thatcher has over 10 years in diversity, equity, culture, and inclusion. He's a change catalyst and one of Business Insider's top diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants who helps big and small companies show up with purpose. So we keep hearing about diversity and inclusion and how it affects the workplace. Can you break down for the listeners, what is diversity, equity, and inclusion? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. And thank you so much for having me rock with you. And everyone that's listening out there in the listener's world of justice and power, I'm all for it. I like that question because there's so many different ways to, to answer what is diversity, equity, and inclusion, because sometimes people even frame that in different ways, right? Some people put the inclusion before the diversity and the equity, and some people put the equity before um, the diversity and inclusion. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of um, scale that. And I think the reason why is that it's up to everyone's interpretation, right? So like the very popular definition of diversity and inclusion by Verna Myers, who's who's the head of diversity at Netflix, you know, she, she'll she say, you know, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion's being asked to dance, right? And, and equity is obviously paying people fairly, right? So that's like one definition. But I feel that diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's all based on how it affects you as an individual. Right. Because if you've never really had to fight for any type of fairness, then diversity don't really matter to you at mm -hmm. all. And if you've never really had to fight for any type of pay equity, equity don't matter. Right. If you've never been around or been in an environment where they kind of propel you and want you to succeed. Inclusion don't matter either. Because mm -hmm. things just kind of work out, you know, they mm -hmm. just work out. So, so that's how, so if you like re, if you reverse how I answer that question, that's how I view diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is bringing people from different backgrounds and cultures in a place where they can succeed. Right. Mm -hmm. And then equity is obviously paying them fairly and knowing their value and doing things that's going to increase their value. And then inclusion is making sure that environment is set up for people not to fail. Mm -hmm. Period. Right. Because, yeah, I've seen organizations do great at the D, do, do OK at the E and suck at the I. Mm -hmm. But then I've seen it in reverse, too. Oh, they're so inclusive and everybody is involved. People ain't getting paid none. And there's very few black and brown, Latino and Asian faces. So it's very rare, at least in my time doing this work. Have I seen places that get all three correct, right? Mm -hmm. But it goes to what I talk about a lot when, whenever I'm out on the road or sometimes doing it over Zoom. I talk about culture, right? Because you and I know what culture means to us, right? But mm -hmm. technically, according to Harvard Business Review, now I got to get a little nerdy on you. No, get nerdy. Get nerdy. Let, right let's now. get nerdy. Let's get weird, <laughs> <laughs> right? But the culture, according to Harvard's been according to Harvard Business Review, is unspoken behaviors, mindsets, and social patterns. Mm -hmm. So when you think about these these mindsets, unspoken behaviors, and social patterns of corporate America, they do not reflect 
the people that are normally at that organization or the people that champion that said culture are always the majority. So there's always someone being left out. Mm -hmm. And primarily men, right? So primarily, right. primarily straight white men. Yeah, and, and I mean, look, like that, that's just the way, unfortunately, like this country was built. But the big problem that and I'm I'm very unapologetically just black all the time. So when when companies kind of scream, oh, our culture is so great, our culture is so great, and I'm like, great for who? Right. Because if it's because if 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 I'm seeing nothing but you know our Caucasian brothers and sisters in roles VP and higher. That means, yeah, they're doing just fine. Right. But director and lower, it's all the black and brown and Asian people and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what kind of culture are you really telling the world that you have? Oh, only these type of people matter and these type of people call the shots? Mm -hmm. Because if that's the culture that you want to, you know, stand behind, I can't stand behind it personally. Right. And we just know that's flat out racist and sexist and all the other isms that are out there. So I always caution companies very, very, very a lot. I, I, I caution them a lot to, to be careful when you brag about your culture, right? Because sometimes that culture is, you know, obviously, you know, that 60 to 70 percent white that are on the VP level and higher. But then it's also about partying and drinking and stuff like that. And what if I was sober? Right. And I started at, at that company, but they have like, you know, thirsty Thursdays or whatever you want to call it, right? <laughs> Right. Right. I obviously don't fit into that culture because that would be triggering for me. Right. But then so, yeah, someone could say, well, why work in a place like that? Yeah. If they're not paying attention to who you are and what matters to you. Yeah. What I, that that's that's a great question. Right. Now, the problem is, is that that's how organizations lose out on people that could be great. Right. So so let's say like maybe I was looking for a new job and I was sober. But if I'm going through that job's website or their Instagram or whatever the case may be, and I see Thirsty Thursdays, that ain't for me. Right. But I could be their next, you know, billion dollar client getter. But I can't I can't work there because y'all doing thirsty thirsty Thursdays like summer, winter, fall and spring. <laughs> like I just <laughs> I can't. So I can't how would a company that. become more inclusive in a situation like that if they have a certain culture? Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. typically the things you talked about out of the mm -hmm. Harvard Business Review are yes. imperceptible to mm -hmm. some degree to the folks mm -hmm. who are practicing these things like unspoken, yeah. unwritten mm -hmm. behaviors, ways of mm -hmm. being how yeah. you get promoted. It's not mm -hmm. written down necessarily, like the unwritten rules, the real deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you deconstruct that if they don't know that they're operating in a way that is yeah. more exclusive as opposed to inclusive? Yeah. Well, the thing about like dismantling the exclusive part to the inclusion part is then to really break down what that said culture is. So when, when I talk to organizations about culture, I break it up into four things. I break it up into learning, enjoyment, purpose and caring, right? And I'll ask if, if I get a chance to talk to an entire company, if it's a small company, if it's a big company, I don't get to talk to as many people, but I kind of ask them, I'm like, so, you know, this is what, you know, the technical definition of culture is, but this is the four things that I kind of break down. And most people tell me that the most, cause most people tell me that their companies lack in the learning and people feeling like they have purpose. They enjoy working there. They feel like the company cares, but they're not learning anything to make them better at their job so they can be, be elevated, especially employees of color, right? Mm -hmm. And employees of color also stress that sometimes they don't feel like they're a part of the shared purpose of that said organization. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about your company. What's the name mm -hmm. of your company? Yeah. And how do you help companies go from the place where they're maybe comfortable and complacent with yeah. their culture, mm -hmm. welcoming and embracing diversity, mm -hmm. equity, yeah. or inclusion to yeah. get to the next level. Yeah. So, so, so I have two companies. So I do have Kenny Thacker LLC, which is a which is a private for profit diversity um, consultancy that that I have. So that so that's when I have these conversations about culture. That's when I have this these conversations about inclusive leadership. That's where I have these conversations about unpacking biases and things of that nature. Today, I know we're here to talk about my nonprofit. So 
because I wear two hats. Um, so my nonprofit is Hunter Rose from Concrete, the premier network for people of color in advertising and marketing. So what we do in Hunter Roses is that we are a network of diverse, very diverse people, um, not just black folks and not just Asian folks and not just Latino folks. We have a couple white brothers and sisters with us too, but we're an organization that provides support and service and engagement to people that are in this advertising, marketing, creative services industry. That's what we are. So we we have several, we have a lot of different programs for our said members, but then we also create programs also for that next generation coming in. And when I when I say next generation, Nakima, I don't necessarily just mean like people 25 and younger. We also create programs for people that are 40 and older. So mm -hmm. we we like to be of service to the industry, especially diverse talent per se, in the industry. And that's what we've been doing for the last three years. Wow. We so how do people join? Years. How do people join the network? And then what yeah. was your purpose in creating yeah. the network? You, yeah. I'm guessing that yeah. you saw a dearth yeah. of welcoming spaces yeah. Yeah. for people who so, fit that criteria. So, so I mean, we have a very selective criteria because we're, we're just a serious organization because we're out here doing the work for the people and things of that nature. But the reason why I created Hunter Rose from Concrete was the total opposite of what you kind of just asked me. I was trying to find my tribe for many, many, many years um, being in the advertising business. for I And after I would say the first 13 years, that's when I actually created Hunter Rose from Concrete. So I, I just created it like three years ago, but I was, I was desperately trying to find my tribe for, I would say probably about eight years, just like going to different things and networking with people. But like, it just didn't feel right. It was almost like, I'm pretty sure you remember when when you went to visit the school that you wanted to go to, right? Uh -huh. And you got to that campus, you were just like, yep, this is home, uh -huh. right? But I couldn't find that kind of tribe in my first couple years getting into the diversity kind of field and things of that nature in advertising. And, and, and no, and this is no shade to anyone whose event that I went to, you know, years and years ago, they were great. It's a great sense of community, but I just didn't feel like I fit in. Right. Even around my own people. Mm -hmm. Why right? is that? Was um, it socioeconomic? Was it because sometimes, let's be honest, when we go into corporate spaces, yeah, we are typically taught that you have to look the part and you have to play the part in order to yeah. play the game. Yeah. And not everyone is willing to assimilate and so even when we're around our own people, quote unquote, yeah, they may snub us or turn up yeah. their noses if we don't fit the bill as someone willing yeah. to code switch yeah. or play yeah. the game to get ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, I just kind of felt like, you know, I was a circle trying to fit in a square. Hmm. Right. And and that sucked. And and I'm and, and I was doing it obviously because I was new to the DNI space. And I felt like, you know, these were spaces where people in same situations as I were, you know, working for a different corporate entity, advertising agency. I was like, oh, okay, so this is where I need to be to meet similar minded people. We were similar minded, but we were still different. How so? Because, well, we were different because like, I'm a Jordans and jeans kind of dude, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not the shiny suit, pointy toe kind of cat and right. slacks. That's just not me. Those spaces had a lot of, so like, like, so I don't want, I don't want to call those folks names because some of them are, are my friends and things of that nature. And they live in those spaces and they thrive in those spaces. But I just didn't even feel like I was thriving at all. And I feel like I had to kind of recant my resume all the time. And it's like, yeah, I've been doing this hardcore and I've been doing this kind of on my own for the mm -hmm. last couple of years, but I got to give you my resume, like, right. Pause. That sounds so, like a more stifling environment than a free environment. I mean, look, like I said, I, I give I give props to those people that paved the way for me to do the things that I that I do today. You know what I mean? But we also do it different because my organization in particular, we are hell bent on creating results. Mm. Tangible results. So, so when I when tell I, us more, what does that mean? Yeah. So tangible results. So like I I can I can state with you know Looking at you 
dead in the eyes and say that 90% of, of, of people that went through our programs find a job within six months after getting out of one of our programs. Oh, wow. If I, if I sit here and tell you that in the last three years, during a global pandemic, we made 10 aired commercials, we did that. When I say that we get, we've given away $20,000 in scholarships to multicultural students around the country, I'm going to say we did that. If I, if I say we've given away $120,000 in full-time jobs, I'm going to say we did that. If I'm going to say we gave away $70,000 in internships to black and brown and yellow and even, and even some of our white participants in internships, we did that. If I'm going to say we gave away over half a million dollars in free media to nonprofit organizations, I'm going to say we did that in three years. Wow. That's incredible. So our number, our numbers don't lie. So when I say we are very heavy on results, yes. that's what I mean, my sister. We are very heavy on results because, because the reason why I created 100 Roses and I didn't tell you this earlier is what that the things that I've done in the last three years, I wasn't able to do in the 13 years that I worked at an advertising agency. Mm. And well, I did all this. Different? Like what caused that shift? Red, did you just one day say, you know what? <laughs> enough is enough. There's no seats for me at these tables. I got to create oh, 100, 100. That's exactly how I felt. I was kind of brutally shown time and time again that there was no seat for me. Hmm. Even after producing time and time again, like like successful program time and time again, just there was like there was nothing for you because Unlike, you know, after 2020, when a lot of companies and corporate companies started caring about diversity, this was like, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, when I was doing a lot of this, like, really cool stuff. But I was doing it also all the way from 2011 as well. But it just wasn't the cool thing to do, needless to say. So after many, many times of kind of just hitting my head up against the wall over and over again, in 2019, I, I, I resigned from the company where I was. And I was just like, you know what? Like, I've done all I can here. Like, you know, the glass ceiling for people of color isn't even glass. It's made out of cement or iron mm. or whatever. The strongest metal, maybe vibranium. Like, right? It's uh, just. You went to the Black Panther reference. Uh, okay. Always, always, always. <laughs> right. But like, I was just tired of hitting my head up against the vibranium ceiling, I developed a very, very bad case in, in full transparency of imposter syndrome. I didn't even know it was called imposter syndrome until I left that place. But it was just like, I kept looking for validation from people that would never validate me or don't give a damn about me in the first place. So that's when I knew, I was like, you know what? It's time for me to go. I'm gonna do this somewhere else. And actually during my last week at that place is when I created 100 Rows from Concrete. Cause I was like, I don't want anyone to ever feel this way ever again. And not to say that, you know, my members don't go through imposter syndrome you know, now and then, and I don't even go through it now and then. Yeah, we all do. But the way that that company made me feel and constantly seeing people like, you know, giving raises or getting promoted or just kind of, well, you we're know, no being, smarter than you. You know, no, you probably, know, you had creativity online. Yeah, but yeah, privilege, I mean, we're yeah, open it doors just, to opportunity yeah. for them. Because I remember like the, the week or a couple of weeks before, before I left, actually, before I left, I... This is before a quiet quitting was a thing. Mm -hmm. I was probably, and, and I'm not saying I, I coined the term quiet quitting because I did not, but, <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I did my version of it, right? So mm -hmm. let me tell you my version of it. So I would say for the last three months that I was there before, because in those last three months, I was figuring out, you know, finalizing the job that I left that place for. But um, I would take one piece of my desk home. So whether it be a picture of my daughter, or I'm a Funko Pop collector. So I had a bunch of Funko Pops on my desk. and But I had a lot of wards on my desk too. Uh -huh. I would take one piece of my desk home for, for weeks on end. Just every day. Wow. And no one noticed. No one noticed Kenny's desk that's normally full of <laughs> and pictures of my kid. <laughs> right. And awards. No one noticed that by the time I put it in my two weeks, my desk was already clear. All I had was a laptop. Wow. And maybe, and maybe a cup where I put all my pens. Like, now, was that, that a was conscious a or a subconscious decision? 
that was to a start conscious clearing decision. out your desk. That, that, that was a conscious decision. I was like, I'm going to be out of here. Right. Like, I'm going to be out of here. And no one noticed. And in, and in my exit interview, you know, God, God bless the young woman that <laughs> had to interview me for my exit interview. But I told her, I was like, no one even noticed that I was quote unquote quiet quitting. Mm. No one noticed. No one noticed. So when it came to my last day, it was like, here's the laptop. Thanks. Wow. But you know, did but, it feel but, liberating on that day when you just oh oh oh, oh cut my the ties, it, cut the cord? It felt, it felt so liberating. I felt like this hundred pound weight was taken off my chest. I mean, even my even my wife noticed this, like the change in my demeanor since I left that place and everything. Like shit, even my kid um, noticed this the the change in my demeanor when when I left that place. But like I said before, I have to be thankful for the for the opportunities that they. They let me kind of grow into this space literally on my own. It's not like I had like a DNI team or anything like that. I had like, you know, a few committed volunteers, but that was it. But like still like the the concepts and the ideas mostly came from me um, or I'd collaborate with someone. But yeah, like 100 Roses was birthed out of the ton. And even my, my for-profit business was born out of just this very bad experience of just like seeing everyone that were either my peers or not even my peers kind of just getting a leg up uh -huh. and, and, or, or, you know, people are like, you know, teacher's pet and things uh -huh. of that nature. And it was just like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be nobody's teacher's pet at the end right. of the day. Like, I don't Did you ever anybody. ask for an explanation as to why people were being promoted ahead of you or given preferential treatment or you just knew intrinsically? I, I, I that was told because you were a man of color. I, I was told to my face. I was told to my face. We don't do diversity roles here. Wow. After, after mind you, this is after when did I have that conversation? 2017. I started doing DNI stuff in 2011. So six years in, you know, this was somebody new to the company or whatever, but you know, they were they heard about me and they wanted to sit down with me and talk to me and whatever, pick my brain. But they were like, yeah, um, we don't do diversity roles here. Wow. So, and I, I wish I could tell you the date of that day, but I can't. But like, I remember it like it was yesterday. But then I even remember me pitching a diversity role. And this is obviously, you know, way before 2020. And I wrote like this very long, like kind of description of what the role would be. And and all the things that I've done, and I handed it over to someone very very high up in the C suite, and she didn't even read. She didn't even read it. Wow! And I put my heart and soul into that document, and like didn't even read it. That sounds like it was demoralizing. Like it, instead it, it of was. being firm, constantly feeling rejected, it, feeling yeah. excluded, and you know what you're bringing to the table. Like that's one yep. of the worst parts about it. When you know yep. that you're better than the way that you are being treated in that environment. Yep. 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 And, and, and that's where, and that's where the imposter syndrome kind of came from because I was like, well, maybe I'm just not doing enough or maybe I'm not doing it right. Or just, you know, constantly second guessing myself, like constantly second guessing myself and knowing that I shouldn't, especially when I looked at my portfolio and I was like, okay, so I've directed like, Four documentaries, like did did this program with this college and da 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 da, and you know it it made it seem like I was doing way less and I was asking for so much more, mm -hmm. right? So so because sometimes you know when I talk to like young people, like some of my college folks or whatever, or graduating seniors or whatever, and they're like, oh, Kenny, I want to get out of school and make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, slow down, <laughs> right? Right? No, no, and not not to say slow down, like oh, I'm I'm taking a crap on your dreams, but it's like. So the process. Like, do you, like, yeah. Like, do you know how much I made when I got out of college? Like right. a quarter of that. A quarter right. of that. Right. So I mean, may, maybe that's maybe they thought I was too ambitious. I don't know. But like, needless to say, nothing happened to me um in that situation. And it really gave me like this, this chip on my shoulder and just kind of seeing other people getting to kind of do things that obviously I wasn't allowed to do. Even even sometimes outside of that company, seeing people 
way younger, 10 years younger, 15 years younger, like getting opportunities that I would like literally give my left arm for. I'd still have my right, but I'd give my left arm for. And just like not getting those opportunities. And people also, whether it was internally or externally, knowing the things that I do, right? Okay. No, knowing that I'm not a one trick pony. I can, I can write scripts. I can direct. I can minorly edit, but I also teach. Like, you know, I can, I can write, you know, punchlines and things of that nature, but, you know, kind of, I was always kind of relegated to just like being like a one trick pony, at least in their minds, even though all the other colors were around them. But for some reason I was just like the color green and I wasn't the other part of the rainbow. So were you the you only know, black person at the company at the time. No, the, I mean, I wasn't the only, but I was one of few and I was very one of few black men in particular. And as mm -hmm. far as doing like purpose driven work, I was the only black man doing purpose driven work. Wow. But but I, I had to lady. but but I had to also create it myself. Like mm -hmm. I had to create all the opportunities that I had. And this is something that I told the young sister that was doing my exit interview. I was like, I had to create all my own opportunities and still I'm leaving here with the same title that I had when I started this job 13 years ago. That's sad. Well, I'm but, glad yeah. that you finally got to the point where you were like, I can't take it no more. I yeah. need a shift. And then you brought a bunch of people along with you. Right? Well, I, I had to. I had to, right? But I, I have to tell you this, Sister Nakima, is that my inspiration for even making a leap like that was Black women, right? Mm. Like my mom, right? And other sisters that I know, because my mom's not my sister. She's my mom. She's the queen. But like... I know that's right. But, but black us and you know, and you got if y'all got to bleep this out, get the bleep thing ready. But to be totally honest with you, black black and brown women have the biggest balls in the world. Now I I concur one hundred. I don't know. I don't know that. I, I might be a little bit biased, biased but I agree with you. Like honestly, when you look what's happened at yeah. what has happened historically, you look yeah. at what's going on now. You look at who's yeah. in the front lines, who's lifting yeah. up their yeah. whole families and. Yeah. Community. It's black and brown women carrying the world on their shoulders. 100%. So, so I will say that, that that inspired me because I would say a, almost a year to the date before I left that place, I put together a panel called Truth. And it was two of my sisters, but two of my sisters that had quit agencies without even like a safety net. And before the panel discussion that I did with them, and I invited like the entire industry to come, like 150 people showed up. But when doing my research and reading different stories from different black and brown women, they were like, yeah, I didn't have a job lined up, but I couldn't take that no more. Right. So I just bounced. And I was just like, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Right. Because as you're taught, don't leave the job you're in till you have your next one. Exactly. So, you know, exactly. You thought we move right into a pandemic. With yep. all that uncertainty and people mm -hmm. really feeling stuck, which yep. is why I think you had that revolution of mm -hmm. quiet quitting. You had Beyonce's song coming out and people like, oh, what's <laughs> up with this? You know? Yeah, I mean. Enough I is mean, enough. You just get yeah, to a I, point where your soul mm -hmm. is being impacted quietly. Yeah, exactly. Because mm -hmm. of the environment that you're in and the conditions yeah. that you're being expected mm -hmm. to accept. Mm -hmm. When you know that that is beneath your greatness. Yeah, you exactly. Black exactly. Black man. Exactly. And, and I mean, and like I said before, even with my portfolio and, and you know, whatever accolades that I had at the time I have a couple more now, but like, they all just seemed useless. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, like my desk is literally full of awards, but people are getting, you know, opportunities over me or they're creating jobs for people like, you know, people getting raises and all. And I'm like, does anybody not see this desk full of like hardware? <laughs> like, you know, but it, it was what it was. Um, But, you know, I can't say that I met some pretty, pretty great people there. I mean, even met my wife there and a lot of the clients that I've had through my for-profit business have been ex-coworkers, ex-white folks that, that I used to work with. And even some of the sponsors of Hunter Roses from Concrete are ex-white folks that I used to work with that believed in me, but knew they couldn't, they couldn't move that needle due to the fact of the position that they were in at that time. So I always give a shout out to my ex-coworkers of all different backgrounds because 
in taking this leap of faith, and I even have the word faith tattooed on my hand. I had it tattooed on my hand in 2020. See, this is but, why I wore a dress that has faith written on it. See, and it's probably, probably the same. And, no, no, oh. but that's my tattoo is in that font. It's my tattoo is in that font right I there. Used to, so oh gonna, my, I cannot. Yeah, that yeah. is amazing. We are, See, that's we are, affirmation, yeah. confirmation. We're we in there. Line. We there. Faith. We, that's power. We there. And, and, and that leap of faith is, you know, what's, what's gotten me here because I remember when I left and all that stuff. And then the play, the, the job that I left it for, like, since I left, you know, maybe six months before COVID started. And so I was working at a job for those six months. Then by March, that place let me go. And I was like, kind of freaking out, like, what am I going to do for a job? And I had hundred roses kind of running already. And, you know, like, I was just like, you know what? type these two words into Twitter or into LinkedIn. And I just type free agent. Mm. And the email box started blowing up. Wow. Oh, Kenny. Oh, did, did, did. oh, you're doing your own thing now? Oh my God. I want you to work with us. Da, 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 da. That's amazing. And, See, look, that's good advice for people listening mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. might be in a similar situation that you were mm -hmm. in, who might feel trapped. Yeah. Who don't know what to do. You're giving mm -hmm. game right now for free. Yeah. Who yep. those yeah. And I give, I've given, I give away game for free a lot, <laughs> but, but I mean, the thing is you have to believe in you. I always tell people this, you have to believe in yourself more than other people will ever believe in you. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't, people can see that. Right. And they're not going to rock with you. Right. So, so you need to have those three P's, right? You need to be positive. You need to be productive in order to make profits. That's how that works. Mm -hmm. That's just how that works. But there's been a lot of times when, you know, people are like, oh, but Kenny, I see you doing your thing. And, I, you know, I, I wish I could do something I, I, I'm, I was passionate about. I was like, what the hell is stopping you? Right. Other than yourself. Oh, well, well, you know, I, I, have, I have a wife and kid and, you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, me too. <laughs> right. Well, but how did you get the confidence and the courage, though? Because a lot of times mm -hmm. when you're in a situation like that and you feel beat down, Mm -hmm. You don't know your place in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, some folks lose sight of their purpose mm -hmm. after constantly feeling rejected. Yeah. Or excluded. How did you yeah. find that confidence to just say, no, I, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just not yeah. doing yeah. it anymore. Yeah. Well, well um, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a super religious person. I mean, you know, I don't go to church every Sunday, but I'm a true believer in God and things that are nature. And it's simple. It, and it's something that we we both learned when we were younger. Right. The Lord didn't bring me this far to fail. That's right. it. Period. Right. Like, look, there are going to be times where we're going to fall down and, you know, we're going to. Oh, my God, everything sucks. Yeah. Some days do suck. Mm -hmm. But a piece of advice I just gave a young Latina um, creative out of L.A. I told her we all get the same 24 hours. It's all yeah. about what you do with them. Yes. Right. It's all about what you do with them. We all get the same 24 hours. Now, I know in some of that 24 hours gotta be with your family you gotta attend to your maybe you got a dog you know like right. but we all at the end of the day get the same 24 hours it's up to you to calculate what you do with those 24 hours yes that's it's it something, it reminds that's me of it. something i tell people a lot of times mm -hmm. it's like own your power mm -hmm. own your time yeah right? no matter yep. what situation you in. i mean i've seen brothers who have been in prison who mm -hmm. have made better use of their time Yep. Than some of us on the outside. Yep. You know, when we're stuck inside of a system in a box that we don't feel like we can get out of, mm -hmm. it's all a matter of your mindset as well, right? It's there's yep. real things that happen, but yep. your mindset and shifting your mindset is half the battle in mm -hmm. terms of getting to where you want to go. Yeah. I, I I totally I totally agree. Cause even like during lockdown, like during lockdown, you know, I I just like literally was like exiting out of that company that I, that I parted ways with or that let me go, whatever the case may be. But immediately I was like, I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> and I hate school. <laughs> and I hate school. But I was like, you know what? I got a little bit of this, of this, of this thing. you know, they owe me a couple paychecks. Da, 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 da. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of consulting. I was like, hey, I'm going to go back to school a little bit. Uh -huh. Went back to school, you know. You know, I'm a historically black college graduate. Shout out to all HBCU graduates out there. Where'd you but go? I went to Lincoln University, the first historically black college. 
All right now. In the United States. But, you know, when I went back to school, I did go to an Ivy League, you know, just just to, just to see what that was like and things of that nature. Obviously, it was online. But, you know, did that and fin- finished my coursework there. I did it like in half the time because I hate school. But, you know, I took advantage well, of that. Though, too. Yeah, Sometimes but I took advantage motivated. of that time that I had because I was like, oh, I got this free time. You know, I can do this obvious on my computer. That it's not like we can go outside. No way. Like, right. it was just like, you know, knock this out, Ken. It, 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 pretty much. Like, knock it out. You you got the funds. Knock it out. And and that's exactly what I did. And, you know, that that's one thing that I think when, when we learn how to even pep ourselves up mm-hmm. and, you know, tell ourselves that that there's a bigger picture. Right. And it's bigger than you and me. Yes. That's how we're able to propel forward. Mm-hmm. in our truth, right? And in our passion and our passions and our purpose, right? Th- those are the big things, right? So I, I I, think lockdown and pandemic, however you want to view it, like, you know, it taught us some things that sometimes we don't even know that we were doing, right? It taught us, it taught us how to adapt. It taught us how to be ready for things that we weren't, we, we kind of didn't think about being ready about, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I'll end Definitely putting our health, physical and mental, on the forefront. That's right. Right? That was something that we kind of put on the back burner a lot. But now it's like, I tell people, I was like, you know what? If you're not feeling it today, you don't got to meet with me today. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Take your turn. I'll be here. You know what I mean? And if I'm not feeling it, I'm also like, I'm not feeling 100 today. Kind of had a crap day yesterday. I need to sit down here a little bit. I'm feeling a little low. My energy is at like three. Uh-huh. I'll see you when I'm back at eight or nine. Right. That's but, good. But that's, that's something that awareness, you know, to be yeah. able to do that. Yeah. But, 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 and I, I'm not going to speak for all black folks, but as a black man, and I'm not even going to speak for all black men, but as a black man myself, I know there was many times when I tucked all that in and I was like, and just kind of continued kind of, working even though I was on a two or on a three emotionally, right? right. And kind of just kind of tried to do the Joker smile, even though I'm dying inside, right? Wow. And accepting things that came my way that were just flat out racist, let's be honest. Like, but just like, mm, well, hmm, I gotta keep my job. I gotta, I gotta be the provider. I gotta, you know, right? No. like no, no one should have to shrink themselves in order to survive. That's true. Period. Right. No one should have to shrink themselves. But I've seen people shrink themselves so much that they don't even recognize themselves. Right. And I feel bad because that's not a that's not a healthy way to live. Right. At people all. Think it's a coping mechanism. But yeah, the, really yeah. feeling your own spirit. But that's I mean, I would go go back to Beyonce's song. <laughs> break my soul. That's what that's yeah. what she's talking about in that song. Yeah. Yep. People put their hopes and dreams into situations. Mm-hmm. Well, they get there and realize, now, wait a minute, I'm, I've gotten this far and I'm still having to deal with racism or white supremacy mm-hmm. or being excluded, being yeah. neglected. It's yeah. a real shock to the system, yeah. right? Especially yeah. if you've been taught, hey, you go to school, you work hard, you'll be yeah. successful. They don't tell you the other part that you mm-hmm. still have to deal with, which are people who have not evolved, who mm-hmm. are in spaces and in these yep. positions who mm-hmm. try to control your destiny when they yep. should not have that kind of power over you. Yeah. And and sometimes it's our own people. Mm-hmm. Same more. So, same times. Sometimes it's our own people. It's our own people. And and I'm going to borrow a word from one of my board members. He said at our anniversary event um last year, but sometimes it's our own people picking the winners and losers. Mm-hmm. That's true. And and if if that's not, you know, white supremacy right there, I don't know what it is. Absolutely. And it's something that we don't talk a lot about. No, we don't. A lot of anti-blackness yeah. even in our community and a lot of yep. different behavior because yep. we're constantly being sent the message that we're less than, we're mm-hmm. inferior. Yep. And we internalize those messages as well and then project those same messages onto our people, yeah. especially too, if there's a socioeconomic divide 
or like you said, somebody wearing a suit versus mm-hmm. wearing jeans and Jordans and mm-hmm. how that's viewed. And I know mm-hmm. for me as an activist, right? I'm an activist, mm-hmm. I'm also an attorney. Mm-hmm. And I've flown in some spaces and I had to I had to pray. Like, mm-hmm. listen, <laughs> I, I got to come in here and be me. Take it or yeah. leave it. Yeah. I still yeah. got to be me at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and one thing, Sister Nakima, that I must say is that the part that hurts my soul is how sometimes if you're outside of whatever the standard is, especially if you're Black. I'm a, I don't want to talk about Black people because... I'm not anything else, but, or black and brown, better yet. But like, if you don't fit a certain mold, uh-huh. right, then you you're don't fit in. Or disregard. You're, you're dismissed. And it's like, look, like, like, can I wear the pointy shoes and the slacks and all? I can wear it probably better than the best of them. Right. I like to, because I ain't, that ain't me. I don't feel free. Right. right. So nice pair of J's, nice pair of jeans. Most likely a hoodie or a sweat, a sweatshirt. That's that's just that's my comfort place, right? But the thing is, I can I can I can be just as charismatic, charming, smart, inquisitive, creative, and either. Mm. But I'm more in my J's and jeans. Right. Cause you're relaxed, you're comfortable, and yeah. it's an extension of who you are. Yeah. It just sucks that sometimes some of the younger generation sometimes sees the non-jeans and Jordan kind of crowd as the blueprint Mm -hmm. and that they, that's what they need to fit into. And it's like, no, you should be able to be you. You should be you wherever you're from. If you're from, you know, Houston, Texas, Atlanta, DC, Philly, Detroit, you know, Inglewood, California. Right. Bring you, man. You know, just bring you. But I think the challenge in this society is that Mm -hmm. we can't necessarily be ourselves in all spaces. Uh So if some, if a young person coming up has a boss like you, Mm -hmm. right. Who is comfortable in your own skin, the way you Mm -hmm. dress, what you like, then Mm -hmm. I think that that would be a good fit for that young person. Mm -hmm. But if they want to walk into one of these companies that is expecting assimilation, expecting you to follow the quote unquote blueprint, then it's probably not going to be a good fit. So mm-hmm. I think educating our young folks to say, hey, you can be you, but that might mean you have to start your own business. Yeah. Or you might have to find someone who is open to you mm-hmm. just showing up with your full self and mm-hmm. understanding that there's compromises that go along with trying to fit a mold that is not really who you are. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Th- that That's almost a whole ball game. I'm just going to add to what you said and say, like, they shouldn't be seeing themselves as a culture fit. They need to be a culture ad. Mm, that's good. That's good. They need, they need to be a culture ad. So like, yeah, yeah, your soup was all right, but you need some of this. You need some of this mumbo sauce. That's, that's, flavor, yeah. that's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, we're known for our flavor as a people. We've never been a bland people. I don't care what situation mm-hmm. we've been in. We've mm-hmm. always, I mean, when I read about the, the slave narratives where they're talking about uh, braids in their hair to map mm-hmm. out the route so they could escape, I'm like, come on now. Who else yeah. can do that but Black folks? I mean, right? that's some, you know, genius stuff. But also it's just like, yeah, I see why they built the pyramids and they created arithmetic. Like, mm-hmm. And why they had to teach everybody else, even though yep. now when you look at school, <laughs> They make it yeah. seem like our kids can't understand this stuff. A lot of it is the way that it's being taught. I mean, I mm-hmm. don't even get me started when it comes to public yeah. education. Yeah. But public the point is, is we have brilliance in our mm-hmm. DNA. Oh, but easily. so often easily. these systems, these companies, these this way of life mm-hmm. flips us of that. And if you don't know who you are, you're going to get lost in the sauce. 100%. We discover the truth. Mm-hmm. So I love what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate it. 100 Roses from Concrete because you are helping people rediscover the, mm-hmm. tr- the truth and their truth. So yep. They can be their full selves, yeah, which we're, is powerful. We're, right, we're doing our best. We're, we're doing our best. And I mean, we're, I mean, we, you know, we're helping obviously our people, but also helping pillars of our community 
which are nonprofit organizations that are there, you know, in good times and bad. These nonprofit organizations have been in our communities, regardless if you're black, white, you know, brown, Asian, or whatever the case may be. We help these organizations and we've helped organizations that help domestic violence survivors. We've helped organizations that help restaurant workers' rights. We've helped organizations that support fathers of all different kinds because some people have two moms and one, one is the mom and one is the dad, or some people are raised by their grandparents. Some people are raised by their big brother, or big sister. We have worked with organizations that help um, young people that are aging out of foster care. You know, you name the problem in, in, our, in our communities, we've helped those um, organizations. And we're going to continue to, needless to say, um, this year. And, you know, as, as far as we can take this until the wheels fall off, um, now, that, that's just what we're going to do. in touch with you? If, um, Hunter Rose if from Concrete. Learn more about your services. Hunter, Hunter Rose from Concrete.com. Okay. You know. Hunter Are Rose you on Concrete. social media as well? Yeah. Yeah. Twitter, um, 100RFC and Instagram, HunterRoseFromConcrete.com. Um, that's that's the Definitely best way to I'll find us. I on Instagram. I um, want to see your journey as it unfolds. Yeah. Just thinking about the nuggets of wisdom that you dropped today. More people need to hear what you have to say and to learn about your experience. I think it's really, really inspiring. And no, before I we appreciate you. our time, I, I want to know, is there anything else that you want to leave with our listeners, mm -hmm. with our viewers, those who are paying attention to this conversation? Yeah. So I'm going to, and, and I think this has kind of been my unofficial mantra for um, 2023, because I said it on stage um, a couple of weeks ago. And it's, it's, it's just two simple words, my sister, show up. Yes. Show up for Black people, show up for Latinx people, show up for Asian people, show up for gay people, show up for disabled people, disabled things that you can see and disabled things that are inside, neurodiverse people. Just show up for all those people and talent from those various diverse backgrounds. Show up. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of the article after article after article on, oh, we should do this and we should do that and we should do this and we should do that. Show up. And show out. That's right. That's right. I know that's right. Well, you speak in my language. <laughs> I appreciate you. you. My language. I appreciate Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on Justice and Power. You dropped so many nuggets of wisdom. I know that everybody who listens to this is going to take something from it. And I hope that they apply it and be able to move things forward in their own lives. That's, so that's, the, that's the only way we can do it. Thank you, Kenny. Appreciate you. No problem.